Okay, uh, next we get to hear from our career development faculty, Dr. Banerjee. Um, he will be talking about APC 11 is a novel target for arsenic mediated zinc displacement leading to cell cycle disruption. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So, um, before I get onto the details of the topic, APC 11, uh, cell cycle, I just want to start with why I work with arsenic, why I focus on cell cycle, and why NAPC 11. And I should thank Dr. Jala for introducing a lot of this material already. So I'll just breeze through most of this, as he has already shown that around um, 225 million people all over the world in around 70 countries are exposed uh, chronically to arsenic, mostly through contaminated drinking water. Um, and of that, around 3 million are located in the U.S., mostly in these areas, the dark areas, from the use of domestic untested well waters for drinking purposes. There are also known hotspots in Kentucky from multiple sources, which could lead to exposure. Anyway, so this is a group one human carcinogen and is causal to multiple multi-organ skin cancers, cancer skin being the most widely known, characterized, et cetera. It gives rise to three different kinds of skin cancers, but I specifically focus on squamous cell carcinoma. In addition, it also gives rise to multi-organ non-cancerous endpoints, including pretty much every organ and system you can think about. In mostly in Western countries, it also is associated with uh, increased risk of developing lifestyle disorders, including cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, it can cause cognitive impairment, adverse birth outcomes, so on and so forth. However, if you are thinking that is all, I'm sorry to disappoint you, because if somebody was exposed in utero and never since birth, they still have a very, very high chance of developing these arsenic-induced cancers and non-cancer endpoints compared to a similar population who are not exposed in utero 40 years after birth. So all of which together, brings to the question, what about mitigation? Well, there, first of all, there is no cure, no known cure apart from symptomatic treatment of whatever symptoms you develop. Secondly, most people, most agencies recommend providing arsenic-free water, which is all well and good. However, if you look at the economic implications of that, this is the estimate for money to be invested in U million US dollars for 10 to 20 years for one Bangladesh village of 100 families. Now compare that to the GDP per capita of Bangladesh in 2021, which is around $2,000. Who is going to pay this? So while it is very, very noble to provide them with water, it's prohibitively costly. And possibly, it's possible, but probably not as plausible. And also, people who have already been exposed in utero or in the early life, they still have a very high probability of developing these diseases, even if you provide them with potable water. So all this together really brings us to the realization that we really need to understand the underpinnings of how arsenic is causing these disorders and what are the possible ways that we can target them. So a lot of research has gone on to understand how arsenic is causing its toxic effects. And as you can see, multiple mechanisms are known, has been uh, hypothesized, has been debated including genotoxicity, altered DNA repair, cell cycle, so on and so forth. My work specifically centers on cell cycle dysregulation. And I chose this because uh, I have mostly worked with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma that is induced by arsenic. However, as I said, arsenic also induces a lot of other diseases, increases the risk for other disorders, and all of them at their heart have cell cycle dysregulation as one of the earliest steps. So by targeting cell cycle, I feel like I could possibly make a difference in multiple ways that arsenic affects us all. Now, to get back to cell cycle, the question always was, arsenic as a single molecule is doing all these changes. How does one single molecule cohesive, you know, does bring about all these changes in all these pathways, all these mechanisms? And a mechanism for bringing all this together was mostly lacking. However, in the last 10 years, we have seen that arsenic or trivalent arsenic can actually displace zinc from zinc finger proteins containing 3 cysteine, 1 histidine, or 4 cysteine motifs. And this 
in turn is important because almost 3% of the entire human proteome are consisting of zinc finger proteins. And each of these play have very important roles in all these mechanisms which have been associated with arsenic toxicity, arsenic exposure. Now, um, conspicuous by its absence from this is cell cycle dysregulation. And that's really where my work goes. But before I go there, the question always is, why do I even think that cell cycle dysregulation has anything to do with zinc finger? So if we look at uh, what arsenic does to cell cycle, they have been studied for quite some time. They have been studied in a lot of different cell lines and almost in every single occasion, arsenic, chronic exposure to arsenic or even acute exposure to arsenic induces mitotic arrest in most cell line studies, unless uh, if there is a Bob, one, uh, Bob R1 suppression in certain cell lines, then we see a G G1 arrest, which is pretty rare. Now, under normal circumstances, the normal progression through cell cycle is mediated or modulated by two ubiquitin, uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase um, multi subunit proteins called APCC or cyclosome and uh, skip colon F box. Now, APCC uh, regulates the transition from G2 to M and M to G1, whereas skip colon F box does it from M, uh, G1 to S and S to G2. Um, both, and, and these are multi subunit proteins with NAPC11 and RBX1 being the catalytic ubiquitination components of uh, cyclosome and SCF respectively. And each of these are ring fingers, which is a specific subtype of zinc finger and is a prime candidate for zinc displacement upon arsenic exposure. In fact, it has been shown that arsenic can displace uh, zinc from skip colon F box at around five micromolars, which is not really um, what we expose people have in them. And we also don't really see a lot of G1 arrest, uh, but we do see a lot of G2 arrest, which puts the focus firmly on anapsi 11. Now, if we look at the structure of anapsi 11, it has three C3 or three cysteine one histidine motifs, one, two, and three. And the structures are shown in here. Now, interestingly, it has been shown that the first and the third C3H zinc finger motifs come together in the three dimensional structure to form the functional ring finger, which is responsible for the ubiquitination function. The second one shown in green here is also capable of binding to zinc, but it does not really play any role in ubiquitination. And based on all of this information, my hypothesis was that uh, arsenic mediated zinc displacement from ring finger domain of anapsi 11 leads to cell cycle disruption which can be mitigated by zinc supplementation. So it's a simple displacement uh, reaction. So by, um, and it's always in a dynamic equilibrium. So if we increase the volume or concentration of zinc, it might be able to shift the equilibrium towards a more zinc bound form, alleviating whatever arsenic is doing. So to see if this is true, the first experiment I did was I took two different human keratinocyte cell lines. One is HECAX and the other is carcities. And I exposed them to increasing doses of arsenic starting at 100 nanomolar going through to uh, one micromolar for 24 hours and then did a cell cycle assay. So the 100 nanomolar is important because it reflects the blood arsenic level of chronically exposed populations from China and Mexico. So it's uh, toxicologically and environmentally relevant. As you can see at each of these doses starting at 0.1 micromolar or 100 nanomolar, there is a significant accumulation of cells in the G2 or M phase. Now, um, flow cytometry doesn't really give me an option to understand whether it's G2 or M specifically, but that's one of the things that I want to do downstream. And we see that in both the cell lines, suggesting that this is not a cell line specific phenomenon. And concomitant with the uh, accumulation of cells in G2M, we can actually see that uh, the stabilization of NAPSI 11 ubiquitination targets cyclin B1 and securin. And the levels of these proteins are actually modulated by NAPSI 11 through ubiquitation mediated degradation to take the cells into G2 and then, uh, sorry, from G2 to M and then from uh, M again to G1. So when these are stabilized, the likelihood that the cells will be accumulating in mitosis. And we, again, we see that both for HECATs as well as carcities. Now, the question could be that one of the possibilities could be that this is not actually taking place at the level of degradation, but at the mRNA transcription. So I looked for that 
and in none of the uh, in for both cycling B1 and secure in, and for both the cell lines, I did not see any difference in the steady state mRNA, suggesting that transcriptional uh, induction is not really causing this, leading credence to the hypothesis that it is probably degradation of these proteins that is uh, adversely affected by arsenic somehow. Next, I also wanted to see if zinc supplementation could uh, mitigate this effect that is induced by uh, arsenic in cell cycle dysregulation. So I used 100 micromolar, sorry, 100 nanomolar arsenic um, treatment and then supplemented in a, in a second uh, situation where I supplemented the cells with uh, one micromolar zinc. And we can see that in, uh, and this was done in HECAT cell lines and the supplementation of zinc actually brought down the proportion of cells uh, in G2 or M phase compared to untreated and significantly down from what arsenic had induced. And that is also associated with a return of both cyclin B1 and uh, securin protein expression back to the basal level. And again, uh, we did not see any changes at the mRNA level with or without zinc, with or without arsenic, which suggests that this is not really taking place at the transcriptional level at all. The next question was, so it all this, together, all this data together really uh, pinpoint to the fact that it is probably the ubiquitination and subsequent degradation that is being affected by arsenic. So we wanted to know, is NFC11 a good enough target? So what we did was, and at that point, uh, this was done by a previous student, and at that point did not have a 3D model of uh, NFC11 available, but there was one available for RBX1, which is very, very similar to NFC11 in terms of sequence homology. And what we saw was we used that RBX1, available RBX1 model to do a homology modeling to see how um, the zinc fingers or ubiquitin related zinc fingers of NFC11 show up on the structure. And what we see, what we are really showing here in yellow are the sulfur atoms of the cysteines that are participating in that uh, ubiquitin catalytic um, uh, ring finger. And so two things are important here. First, there is a lot more yellow that is visible on NAPSI 11. In other words, it is a lot more accessible compared to RBX1 to arsenic. So arsenic will be, uh, it will be easier for arsenic to go and attack that um, cysteines or ring finger and displace zinc compared to RBX1. And the other interesting thing is RBX1 is unique in that uh, it is not a C3H uh, or C2H2, it is a C2 HD where one of the um, cysteines is actually converted to aspartate and as such arsenic is not really able to distinct uh, to dislodge that zinc from that particular part of the ring finger. So together all these data suggests that anapsi arsenic might be preferentially displacing zinc from anapsi 11 compared to uh, RBX1 which will also kind of fit into the observation that we have had from so many different cell lines that it's almost every single time a mitotic arrest rather than a G2 arrest. Finally, another of the earlier students did this experiment where um, he took um, APC11 or NFC11 uh, bound to GST beads, uh, on GST beads, I believe, and then um, added cyclin B, which is a known ubiquitin target for NFC11, and then increased, uh, incubated that with increased dosage of arsenide and looked at what happens to cyclin B1 ubiquitination. And as you can see that with increasing doses of arsenide, the ubiquitination signal, which is the, this top dark band black smear, it keeps going down almost in a dose response effect, which suggests that arsenide can um, abrogate the ubiquitin function of anapsi 11. So, all this together leads me to conclude that arsenic exposure leads to the accumulation of multiple human keratinocyte uh, cell lines at G2 or M phase of the cell cycle. And this accumulation is associated with the stabilization of specific anapsi 11 ubiquitination substrates, cyclin B1, as well as securin. And we can reverse this trend if we do a zinc supplementation 
which is also, I must say, is very physiological. It's not to the point where it should induce metallothionine or anything else. Uh, it is also associated, this, uh, abro uh, this uh, reversal is also associated with the suppression of arsenic-induced stabilization of anapsi 11 ubiquitination targets, which are cyclin B and securin. Further, this induction of uh, or suppression of cyclin B1 and securin expressions that we see at the level of proteins, either with arsenic exposure or with zinc supplementation, cannot be explained by differences in the steady state mRNA levels of either of these. And finally, arsenic exposure is modulated, uh, modulated cyclin B1 and securin levels, possibly through abrogation of ubiquitination mediated degradation, which is something that I still want to do going ahead. So the future plans include first to determine if arsenic exposure is leading to the accumulation of cells specifically in G2 or M. And that is something that I have to do either with immunoblots and with uh, mass cytometry, which is what I have proposed in the R01 that I submitted recently. Secondly, to determine the ubiquitination status of uh, this anapsi 11 substrate, cyclin B1 and securin, uh, upon arsenic exposure and zinc supplementation directly in a cell line rather than in vitro, and thirdly, to investigate the direct physical binding and mutual displacement of arsenide and zinc using commercially available um, anapsi 11 ring finger peptides. So why is this important? I think we have, I've already shown this figure where cell cycle disrupt, disruption leads to all these diseases which are already known to be associated with arsenic exposure. However, each and every one of them are also associated with uh, risk of uh, uh, dietary deficiency of zinc. And these are all from human population studies where they have done um, you know, um, measured zinc or arsenic and have shown that when there is deficiency of zinc, the risk of developing each of these disorders are higher than corresponding populations that do not have this deficiency. So I see that my research from this is uh, right now is focused on cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, but it can actually get to a state where it actually is responsive to multiple arsenic induced disorders in populations that are not particularly financially uh, affluent. And it's possibly a lot more uh, plausible to get to people who cannot afford uh, potable water in the long run. And this will solve not only acute NS squamous cell carcinoma, well, I shouldn't say solve, but you know, help at least, but multiple myriads of other uh, disorders that arsenic exposure is causing them. And at this point, I will stop and I will thank uh, Dr. Stace's lab, all my colleagues, um, the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, uh, CIEHS, as well as the P30 program for giving me this opportunity to take my work in a new direction. And I'll be happy to take any questions.